So this is a quick cure for the shame of untested software. My name is Daniel Meester, and uh, Test Noir is my little startup project. Uh, but my day job is at Percona, MySQL tool specialist. And so a lot of the, the testing I do is at Percona. Uh, before we get too far into this talk, I want to I want to kind of make a disclaimer and uh, talk about the title a little bit. So the title is Quick Cure for the Shame of Untested Software. And the first part of that title is the quick cure part. So this is not a long-term prescription. You know, quick cure is something like uh, ibuprofen. If you have a headache, you know, you take some ibuprofen, maybe you can keep taking it for a week or so. If you have headaches constantly, you should probably go see a doctor. You know, so similarly, you know, this talk is about a quick cure for uh, you know, the shame of uh, untested software, which means that you know, if in the long run you're always having you know, the shame, this, uh, this situation where your software is not tested or you can't get your developers to test it, Maybe there's a different problem that can't be addressed by, by what I'm about to talk about. So the other part of this, this title is for the shame of untested software, which means you know, it's different from a quick cure for untested software, which is something different. So I just want to set the expectation at the beginning of this presentation. This isn't going to be technical. I don't go through and you know do code examples and show you oh you know do this in your test files and there you go now you have tested software you know, for a simple reason which is you know, if I tried to do that uh, it would be so vague and nebulous as to be useless because you know there's not a lot of people in here about 14 15 so you know, we can do a real easy check uh, who here is developing in Perl for example. Couple people who here is developing in PHP. Uh, other people, Python. Oh, wow, there's like the like that side of the room is all Python. Do you all know each other? No. Wow, you just made some friends. Uh, Ruby. Yeah, Ruby. Java. I oh, see this side. Java. Who's doing like web apps? Yeah. Who's doing GUI stuff? No GUI. Oh, okay, a little bit. Command line stuff, Linux, Windows, one Windows. See, it would be pretty much impossible for me to do like a technical presentation, like showing you do this and do that. You know, I could do a few languages here and there, but you know, the vast majority of people would not get anything out of it. So, what this really addresses is, you know, a different issue you know, that uh, that I'll that I'll talk about more here in a second. So again, you know, the expectation at the beginning is, is this is like me opening the door, you know, allowing you to get a foot you know, in the door. But ultimately, it's still your responsibility to walk through and continue walking, you know, i.e. implement this quick cure, test your software, and then continue testing your software. And in the long term, you know, apply better you know, practices uh, address whatever the underlying causes in your organization or with your team that you know, has given rise to this initial shame in the first place. So that's why I say, you know, after a month, reevaluate your situation. If you're still having problems with your developers or whatnot, then there might be another issue. So let's get into the meat of it. So at Test Noir, since it's a company about testing, I, I talk to a lot of other companies and I talk to a lot of other developers uh, about their testing and their test practices. And what has surprised me is that most, so far, uh, don't test. Or they, I know, there's one guy back there that looked shocked, but it's true. I, I talk to a lot of companies and they say, oh no, we're not really testing. Uh, or if they do test, it's kind of like this ad hoc manner. There always seems to be some other guy that has like scripts on his machine and he does the testing right before release. I don't know why it's always some other guy and I'm not talking to that some other guy, but maybe this is a fictitious you know, person that people invent when they're talking to me so they don't feel like bad or maybe so they you know, can abate the shame a little bit. But now that's a common one. So 
Yeah, believe it or not, I talk to a lot of developers and companies and, and they don't test their software. So that's you know, where this, this presentation kind of came from and uh, what got me thinking about uh, the reasons for untested software. But let me say first, uh, two things. When I talk to these people, these companies, they all agree, the one thing that's unanimous is they all agree is that testing is good. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely testing is great, you know, we should do it, etc. Which is kind of a, a stark contrast from what we just said, you know, they say, no, we're not testing. But testing is really good. It's kind of a, a weird contradiction. So they all agree that it's good. Uh, the other thing that is kind of ubiquitous among their response in, in our conversation, and another reason for which this is not a technical presentation, is that for all of these companies and developers, the technical aspect is not the, the problem here, it's not the limiting factor. Uh, you know, for example, all of you are probably developers or product managers. You know, is there anyone here, and it's okay to admit it, is there anyone here who's not testing because they don't know like how to use their languages test framework, like it's a technical problem? Is anyone just having base technical problems with testing? Yeah. Okay. But I mean, you could under, what's your language? Ruby? Or even Ruby? Oh. Yeah. Do you think you, you could you know, understand how it works though in C sharp? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, so kind of like, you know, this crowd, no one so far has told me, well, I don't, for example, like Perl's uh, test more, uh, test harness, no one has ever told me, I, I just, we just don't understand test more, test more. It's, it's too big, it's too difficult. So it's not a technical limitation. So I got to thinking, okay, so everyone agrees that it's a good thing to do. No one says that we have these technical hurdles we can't overcome yet they're still not doing it. So what are the root causes for this? And the two root causes that I've arrived at are, as the images show, time and money. So let's uh, start off talking about time. The most common reason, and I'll bet you many if not everyone in here has experienced this at one time or another, is this argument that there's just not enough time to do testing. You know, we have to get this project done, we have to get this program done now, and we just simply don't have the time to implement the features we must have and do like the testing for it. Is that anyone here ever had that? Yeah, pretty much everyone's head is nodding. Uh, you know, I know this, this, this experience really well myself because uh, at my day job, Perkana, we just launched a, a product on Tuesday, and uh, I was up till about 1 a.m. Sunday morning uh, doing testing. So uh, I know what it's like, you know, this feeling that there's not enough time. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about this in, in, in the come. So, and there, there's also this other kind of feeling at this point that maybe call it the egotistical argument that we're experienced programmers, so we're going to write good code. It's, it's not going to fail. I know people snicker. I kind of actually mean this semi-seriously because uh, if you are, you know, a really experienced programmer uh, and you really know what you're doing and, and you're not programming when you're tired or programming late, um, you very well might write a bunch of stuff that just doesn't fail, you know, regardless of it having been tested or not. So we kind of, you know, we, we, we argue from this point, oh, well, it's, it's simple stuff. It's not going to blow up. And if it does, it, it won't hurt. Yeah, there you go. So, and the other thing uh, in this kind of vein of reasoning or, or uh, argument is uh, there's a pressure from management that doesn't know or understand or care about testing. Has anyone experienced that? Like, you're the programmer and man you know, management is like, well, what does that matter? You know, we're trying to get a product here. They don't understand testing and they kind of push it out. Yeah. A few people nodding their heads. So. You know, that's, that's a problem at this point, is management that doesn't, let's say, value testing. So, also related to time, there's also the flip side to it, which is too much time. So, this is mostly from the developer's perspective. Uh, 
well, which means it, it happens that there's cases where we have you know excess time, or let's say that we're not behind schedule. Uh, we have a month to finish this, and we're really sure it's going to be done in a month, no problem. So we have this excess of time. As a developer, what's your kind of inclination? What do you want to do? What, what, what would you do? Yeah, so what would you do if you have time? Yeah, write features. You start doing cool stuff. Does anyone here have the inclination to write documentation? <laughs> I know. Oh, yeah, see, there's one guy. Yeah, see. Yeah, you could probably just take this whole presentation and adapt it for documentation as well, like a quick cure for the shame of undocumented software. Uh, so in any case, yeah, I find this to be a, a root cause as well. If the problem isn't too little time, and there's actually maybe not too much time, but you know there's time to spare, then developers gravitate towards cool things, towards cool features. You know they don't want to spend that time writing tests. The other argument uh, on this side is sometimes the reoccurring time costs of tests. People sometimes feel like, oh, if I if I write tests and, and get into that 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 whole situation, then I'm going to be continually running those tests over and over again. It's basically the time sink argument that they're going to have to spend a lot of time in the future running these tests and fixing the test failures and doing all this kind of stuff. Uh, so it's going to cost them too much time in the future. So those are the kind of two flip sides uh, for the argument from time on a root cause or reason for untested software. Switching to the, the money the money factor, there is naturally uh, the reason or the fear of losing money. This is uh, mostly a concern for managers, uh, release managers, product managers, etc. Sometimes the argument is, you know, we need to ship this program and, and start making money. We've been working on this for however many months. You know, they're aware of how much this is costing their company, and it's time now to get this out the door have it start making us some money. Anyone run into that situation? Yeah, a couple. And I'll admit, you know, I, I'm a programmer, but I'm also a product manager as well. So I feel this from time to time too. Like we have to get this done and this needs to start you know, generating something, you know, if not buzz or revenue or something. Also on this side, sometimes people in marketing will say that tests aren't a selling point. So you know, if we have this great test suite, well, so what? That's not going to help us market the software. Uh, sales might also say this as well. Uh, if you sell your software that you know, customers don't pay for tests, they pay for the program or features or something like that. You know, they don't pay for tests. And also, there's another kind of managerial argument from here, which is that Less time developing means lower costs, which means a higher return on your investment. Um, if, if to the pure programmers in the group, if that doesn't mean much to you, I can tell you, you know, from, a, from like a, a management point of view, you know, we do think about these things because it takes time to develop it. And you know, if things take too much time to develop, then it might not happen in the first place. So there's this, this balance that's, that we try to strike. Yeah, I'll get to that. Yeah, I'll get to that at the end of the presentation. Uh, let me say, I, I don't agree with that. You know, if marketing says it's not a bullet item, the sales says it's not something that can be sold, that's uh, patently, that's pretty much just wrong. And I'll, I'll show, a, in my opinion, a really good uh, analogy why. So we'll get there. Uh, so the last part on the money side is, uh, if not losing money, then of course spending money. Uh, this is usually a concern from the customer's point of view, or at least uh, the company or the developers trying to perceive the customer's point of view, which is the customer wants to pay for the product. They don't want to spend money on these test things that they don't necessarily receive in, in the shipped product. Uh, 
But what I also find here that's kind of interesting is that testing is sometimes kind of made a, a secondary product or thing. I, I see it as kind of an additional store warranty. Uh, if you've been to Best Buy recently, have you noticed that you know, when you buy a product, say it's like a GPS, the, the product itself has its own warranty, but now for everything you buy, even if it's like a clock radio, uh, Best Buy will want to sell you this, this second warranty, their own kind of, yeah, some people know what I'm talking about. They want to sell you their, their own secondary warranty on top of the manufacturer's original warranty. I feel that sometimes this is what we do to testing. We say, okay, here's this product, this thing we're going to build for you. It'll have all these features. By the way, would you like to buy our you know, warranty, a.k.a. our testing, on top of it? And, and then, of course, the customer says, well, no, you know, we only have X amount of dollars, and you said we could get this for those dollars, and now you're trying to sell me this, you know, the old you know, joke about cars, the rust-proofing, so to speak, and it doesn't go over too well. Um, there's a solution for that, too. So, just in summary real quick, the two root causes, I think, boil down to, to time and money considerations. Uh, too little time. We need to get this done, no time for tests, or too much time. Yay, we have a lot of time, let's do features and cool stuff, and forget about tests. Uh, money, if we don't ship this thing, we're going to start losing money. Or money, you know, tests aren't something that the customer wants to pay for. So, if that is a good kind of, uh, you know, prognosis of, of the problem, then a quick cure must address you know, these directly. So if the one issue is time, then a quick cure needs to be something that makes testing really quick, or at least greatly reduces the time. And on the money side, that's a little bit different. Uh, you, sometimes, if not always, you can't just get rid of money considerations. Uh, you probably just don't want to get rid of money in general, if that money is coming into you, you know, be like, ah, oh, yeah, sure, ten thousand dollars, now fine, we'll just cut off five of that and do five. You no, know? so you really can't get rid of money. The trick here, if you want to call it that, I don't think it's like a sleight of hand or anything, but the trick here is replacing the money consideration with value propositions. And what I mean by that is, you know, for example, uh. Apple products like this MacBook. Apple does a really good job of replacing cost considerations with value propositions. Uh, we all know that you know, Apple products cost way more than other products. These you know, MacBook Pros are a thousand dollars more than a Toshiba or something like that. And yet Apple is the most, I think, still the most valuable company in the world according to market capitalization and stock. So why is that? It's not because Apple goes around you know, saying, ah, our laptop's more expensive. No, they would never win on that front. What they go around doing is selling you value propositions. Oh, you know, all of our software works together. It looks really sleek and simple. It has this you know, metal encasing and a unibody design. That's the value proposition that they're publicizing. And the same applies here to tests. If the problem is cost, you kind of turn it around and turn that into a value proposition, and we'll see how. So, the quick cure, three part, and kind of like a, a cure, like medicine to keep extending the analogy, is that I think all three of these parts have to be, say, taken together as prescribed, uh, because in isolation they're not really effective. Uh, we'll see here as we, as we go through. So, let's get to the, the first part, which is dispel ologies. So, the testing body of knowledge is vast. If you haven't bothered to look at any formal books on it, and I can understand why, I can tell you that there are some pretty big books on testing. Uh, different methodologies, uh, different ideologies, and a whole lot of terminology about testing, you know, some of which I've listed here. But frankly, you don't need to know any of this. Not, you know, not up front, not to get over the shame of, of having untested software. Again, remember, this is a quick cure. 
for the shame of untested software. It's not a long-term prescription. So let me give you a really good example about how you can employ something masterfully without knowing the kind of academic uh, body of knowledge behind it. Uh, I think everyone in here is a native English speaker. So using, my, my, uh, using English as an example, you can speak perfect English without having a really good grasp of grammar, of English grammar. And here's an example. Who here knows what the difference between a transitive and an intransitive verb is? Two people? And the rest of you are native English speakers, right? And yet you speak English perfectly without knowing the difference between a transitive and intransitive verb? Yeah. It's the same with testing. You can be an expert tester and not know what the difference between acceptance testing and behavior-driven testing is. For those who are curious, a transitive verb takes a direct object. An intransitive verb cannot take a direct object. So this leads to the distinction between uh, lay and lie. So technically, you lay an egg, or a chicken lays an egg, because lay is a transitive verb, and the direct object is egg. And lie is an intransitive verb, so you lie down. So when people say, oh, I'm going to go lay down, strictly speaking, that's grammatically incorrect. So. Yeah. If you're curious, I, I, I have a master's degree in French, and so my, my understanding of French grammar is really good. But uh, my understanding of English grammar was poor, and I picked it up mostly through learning French. When I learned French, I learned grammar really well, and then I realized all these things that I had no clue about in the English language. So, in any case, just an example to show you that you can be a master at something without knowing the kind of academic rigors behind it. And furthermore, I think that that academic body of knowledge, if we want to call it that, I don't mean academic in, in a kind of derogative sense, in any case, it puts testing in an ivory tower that, that's difficult to reach. So I say the first part of this quick cure is to dispel the ologies, to just get rid of them completely, and realize and accept that testing only requires tests. That's it. In other words, if you have this, this shame of untested software, you know you should do it, it's just not happening. First and foremost, don't burden yourself with the methodologies, the audiologies, the terminologies. Don't worry if you're truly doing test-driven development. Don't even worry about writing, test, writing failing tests first. Uh, I'm not saying that these are bad things or that you shouldn't do them. Again, this is a quick cure, it's not a long-term prescription. Getting rid of all these ologies just makes it easier to start. And plus, knowing them in the first place is not requisite for testing. And I'll admit that when I, when I really got into testing myself, uh, I didn't know all those methodologies and things. I learned them as I went along. And you'll do the same too. So kind of to address your concerns over there, you know, if you're just getting into testing, you'll pick this stuff up. You don't have to run out to the store and buy a huge book on testing. So, let's move on to the second one. Employ simplicity. Could you imagine trying to learn to play the piano if that was your starting piece? I mean, that, that's, that's pretty complex. Strictly speaking, you, you could learn to play the piano starting off with, with music like this, but would it be any fun? No. Uh, would you be inclined to do it? Yeah. Imagine your first day at piano class and you sit down with your teacher and they're like, all right, here we go, chopsticks be damned. I mean, if you were really like dogged about it and you really, really wanted to learn the piano, you might you know, you know, might slog through this, but really this is no way to get started in something. You know, it, it's very discouraging. And 
consequently, that's not why we, we start off with you know, sheet music like this when learning an instrument. Usually we start off with something like that. Sorry, Curiosity, does anyone recognize that song? Last time I gave this talk, someone did. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, it's Jingle Bells. Yeah, I know. Well, I, okay. Well, you know, I, I can't control the images Google Images gives me. So, uh, but yeah, that's Jingle Bells. So I think this is a really good, you know, contrast and a really good analogy and argument for the power of simplicity. Everyone here knows Jingle Bells? Yeah? Everyone? So everyone in this room knows Jingle Bells. And a few people can even look at this and see that it is Jingle Bells. Does anyone have any idea what that is? I see some people trying to figure it out. I'll be amazed if you could figure this out. In the interest of time, I'm going to have to move on. It's a soundtrack from Avatar. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but there's something more to this, this contrast. Oh, I see. Well, you know. <laughs> yeah, I see. Well, th there's something a lot more to be learned in this contrast, which is, first, Jingle Bells is a classic. It's enduring. It's known by millions of people. It's known by everyone in this room. And what that demonstrates is that simple doesn't mean useless. Jingle Bells may be simple, but like I said, it's an enduring classic. It's known by millions. So simple doesn't mean useless. And this applies to testing as well. You don't have to do the avatar of testing at the start. Remember, again, I keep repeating myself, but it's to drive home the point. It's a quick cure for the shame of untested software. Don't try to do this off the start. Even if this is what you get off the start to just get yourself over that hump and start testing your software, it can be great, just like Jingle Bells is great. So simple doesn't mean useless. So the third part, publish results. And I don't say this because, you know, Test Noir is about publishing results online and stuff. I, I actually truly believe that this is an integral part of starting testing and, more importantly, continuing testing. And I think it's less obvious than the previous two. Getting rid of you know, complexities, the academic whatnot, is maybe you know, easy to accept. Uh, employing simplicity is maybe easy to accept. But I think the idea of publishing the results is, is less obvious. So for test results, there is the results and what we do with the results. So here we have results, car crash test results. And you know, in this lab right here, someone is learning something, ostensibly, hopefully, about the car, you know, the engineers, whoever else is involved in, in doing this kind of thing. But what good is this if those results are never published? Well, again, it still serves a purpose. The, the, the engineers of this car and the company have learned something. But if the results aren't generally published, then does it have the same efficacy? I don't think so. So the first reason for tests and results is, of course, to learn from it. But I argue that the second reason for testing and those results is to publish them. To extend the analogy, car crash test results are published. And that's such an integral part of, of you know, crashing cars into walls that all new cars must have crash test results listed on them. Every new car that sticker on the window will have you know, front impact crash rating, side impact crash rating, et cetera. Because that's an integral and valuable part of testing. And so this goes back to what uh, we were talking about, you know, not being an item on marketing and sales lists. This is how you transition from that cost consideration 
to a value proposition. Testing and test results become a value proposition when you publish those results. Now, just like it's, you know, car crash uh, test ratings and safety ratings are a value proposition for cars that have really good crash test ratings. Uh, similarly, you, know, you want to be able to say about your software, oh, our software has five-star test ratings or something like that, just like car manufacturers do. And of course, naturally, your test results, whether positive, you know, if they're positive, i.e. they pass, that's great. You know, we have tested software that pass, you know, just like having a car that doesn't you know, catch on fire when it runs into a wall. Uh, and even if the pass are, or the tests are negative, i.e. your tests are failing, they're not passing, that's still valuable to your engineers. Just like when these companies crash cars into walls, if they find, uh, I actually read about this once, there was some car crash test, they found that uh, one of the knobs on like the climate control would like pop off and, and hit people in the car, some weird thing like that, like parts would fly off inside the car. So even negative results are a good thing. But, you know, in the end, you have to publish these results. Uh, and furthermore, when you publish results, kind of put them out there, uh, you make them available to sales and marketing. Uh, generally, you know, only when they're good and passing, because sales and marketing aren't going to and try to say, we have you know, tested software. It's not passing right now, but at least it's tested. Well, you know, eventually I'm sure you'll get all your, your tests passed. And putting them out there, then sales and marketing and your managers, everyone will, you'll find, they'll pick it up and they'll be like, oh, sweet, you know, our software is tested. They might not have any clue what that means. It could be like one test. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, well, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, do we really, really understand what the difference between a four star and a five star on a side impact crash test rating means? Does anyone? No. I mean, yeah, see? see and, and that's really all that matters. And even with, you know, software testing, it's tested on these platforms and, it's pass, and it passes. That's better than other software or companies that don't have tested software. And if it comes down to a competition, then you could just get into numbers. Oh, well, we have 50,000 tests and they only have 25. Even if you don't really know what that means, even if 49,000 of your 50,000 tests are you know, whatever, really simple and silly. So, yeah. Oh, I, I fully agree. Uh, and, you know, funny story about that. One of the companies I talked to, they make, uh, and this is um, when I lived in another state, so I'm sure no one will ever, you know, connect the, the pieces and figure out uh, who I'm talking about. But they make software that tracks juveniles through the juvenile detention system, and they don't test it. Could you imagine what, what a bug in software like that would result in? Poor little Timmy was only supposed to be in juvie for five years, but it's been ten and he's still there and no one knows why. Oh yeah, or he gets, or he gets out of it. I, you're right, I shouldn't be such a, you know, pessimist. I mean, but it's, it's true. That's, that's crazy why you would not test stuff like that. So it's basically, you know, government software that tests. You're right. Depending on what you do, you're, each test can really matter. So, but even in, in general cases, you know, like I'm saying here, publish your test results, and it, it has this great psychological effect, not only on you, because now you have to kind of own up to it, uh, but everyone else in your organization. And you'll find that it's usually uh, a good, it, it creates a good and positive thing. I've never heard of a case where developers came along and they said, all right, we're testing it. And management or sales and marketing comes back and says, what the hell? Why are you testing software? This is a waste of time. This is ridiculous. Stop doing that. I've never heard that. It's always the case so far that they say, oh, that's great. We're going to start using this information now. 
just like these car crash test ratings. So third and final kind of principle, if you want to call it that, is publishing results is part of testing. If you're doing testing, but then throwing away the results, what good is it? So I encourage you to publish those results. Do something with them, even if it's just inside your development group, even if you just send it to an internal email list, do something so someone else sees it. Publish the results somehow. Uh, you can put them on the web even if you want, which is you know, part of what Testmore does. Or again, just keep it simple and publish it inside your own development. Well, that's good of them for asking for those. Uh, a lot of people don't a a even uh, ask for tests, which I think goes back to what I was saying earlier, that we kind of sell tests as that kind of rust proofing, that add-on, that secondary warranty thing. My opinion you know, is, well, at least when I'm involved in the process of talking with a customer or whatnot about a, a new pro a product, I always say, you know, and testing. You know, there is no secondary, it's all one. But it's not always the case, and that's a reality whether we like it or not. So it's good of them to ask, and it should always be in there. So that's the quick cure for the shame of untested software. Just to recap briefly, Dispel the Ologies helps address the, the consideration or the concern and reason of time. Uh, don't worry about if you're doing tester and development or any of these kind of academic, you know, restrictions on it. Testing only requires tests. Just start writing tests. The other thing that helps diminish the, the time reason for not doing tests is simplicity. You're a programmer and you're an engineer. I understand that you want to make great and wonderful things, but this is, you know, there's a problem here that has prevented testing from coming to life in the first place. So start off simple first, just to get something down and done, get some basic testing. Remembering that simple doesn't mean useless. Even simple tests will still be useful and they'll probably grow and blossom into, into greater things in the future. And third and finally, the cost consideration. When you publish your results, not only does it have the kind of psychological effect of uh, you know, showing that it's been done and now people can use the results in selling and marketing and whatnot, but it also helps turn those cost considerations into a value proposition because the test results are valuable just like car crash test results are valuable but only if you make them available to other people and talk about them and publish them. So, thank you. Well, we're about five minutes early so uh, if anyone has questions or whatnot uh, and stick around. Otherwise, I don't want to hold you up at the end of the conference. So feel free to leave if you wish. Yeah, Perl, PHP, and Python. Uh, strictly speaking, the PHP and Python, uh, they work because those languages like PHP unit and Python nodes can output in a J unit or X unit XML. You know, X unit in XML doesn't have a, an established standard, so it kind of varies a little bit. But it's basically X unit results in an XML file. That's actually what it parses. So strictly speaking, any language that can that's X unit based and can put it out in an XML file would work. I just haven't tested it. And again, since there's no official standard for that, it varies. So I'd have to get a sample and, and test parsing it. Short answer, yes. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, I can only learn so many languages. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I know it seems silly, but I think the simplest thing is testing the most obvious expectation. Because uh, you know, again, if you start to get into the academics of testing and whatnot, you can start talking about edge cases and outliers and things like that, um, which are fun and interesting, but you might as well start with the most obvious thing. So to use a super simplified example, if you have some sort of function that if given one returns two, then just test that. You know, let's say it's a mul you know, an incrementing function or something like that. You don't have to start off with all the, the weird edge cases and outliers. And I, I think the reason why some people don't do that is they'll say something like, well, it's obvious that's never going to fail. Uh, it's again that kind of uh, the argument from the egotism. Well, we're good programmers. We wouldn't mess up something not obvious. You know, we recognize and acknowledge that. You know, this isn't like a challenge to your ability to write and get the basics correct. This is you know, a getting started point. Because, uh, like you said, if the problem becomes, well, we need to test these edge cases, and that's really difficult, and that leads to not getting anything done, well, you've lost everything. So even if you do the simplest stuff, and even if it seems kind of silly, you've, you've planted that seed. And furthermore, you've created a foundation from which you build on. And also, uh, maybe someday I'll, I'll, I'll modify this presentation, but I've seen cases where the most basic stuff fails. Uh, for example, uh, you bunt to 11 ships with a broken PHP unit. Completely broken. I'm pretty sure it's Ubuntu 11. might be 10. Doesn't run in any sense whatsoever. That, and that they probably said the same thing. Well, it's no use testing that. It's obvious it'll never fail. Well, it did. So, and I've had software myself that, you know, dash dash help didn't work. So, I would say just do whatever, do the easiest cases. And if the problem is like because the code is too difficult to test, like spaghetti code? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I had someone ask me that the last time I presented this. Uh, again, for the simplicity thing, you don't want to start a massive refactorization um, you know, process because you should only do that when you have a solid test foundation so you know that you didn't break anything in the refactorization. But what this means is it gives you, they kind of, now, they kind of go hand in hand. So isolate part of the spaghetti code that's going to be easy to, to factor out and take that as your, your time and your opportunity to test that part you just factored out. Because you're going to, the whole point of you know, refactoring is to, to isolate these uh, logical units and make them testable. Yeah. So use this as an opportunity to do that. Now you're killing two birds with one stone. And again, I don't even encourage the massive operation. Pick something like, oh, this is obviously should be its own subroutine. Put it in its own subroutine, test just that subroutine. Simple. And it's again, it's that foundation. And then chip away at that over time. And again, you're killing two birds with one stone uh, because on the larger scale, you're building um, this foundation that I talked about. So you'll get a foundation, and then in the future, if you do a, another refactorization or, or redesign of an interface or something like that, now you have this, this foundation you've established. So. Simple, simple is good. Is there one? Like what? Not heard of it. They really don't have any type of. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like MySQL's MySQL test runner is <laughs> is like extremely high level integration testing, which begs the question: How would you do kind of like testing on you know, say MVCC isol transaction isol isolation level testing with something high up like that? I don't think there's a bubble. Um, 
Yeah, I think you have to start kind of rolling your own. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the obvious, you know, or I shouldn't say the obvious, the easiest would be just those super high level integration things, but you know, at a certain, like that high level of abstraction, as you probably already know, you can't test those finer details. There's even no simple way to do it because they're just buried down in there. And if the original developers haven't exposed any way to get to those, I think that's one of those rare cases where you're SOL, um, meaning you have to roll and write your own. Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, PHP's uh, uh, you know, X unit based test framework is, is pretty standard. Looks the same in Python uh, as in Java, as in other languages. Well, the whole X unit is a, a standard approach to, to unit testing anyway, that most languages, most modern languages employ, um, except for like maybe Perl, uh, C, and C. There are X unit frameworks for them now. And I think, yeah, it's fine. Um, the PHP unit, to my knowledge, is pretty much the de facto standard. Uh, it does a good job. Uh, and I like that it will put out the results in uh, X unit XML, which you can then parse, which is what TestMar does, and you know, handle it programmatically. So I think it's good. Uh, I come from the Perl world, you know, which is way simpler. Uh, Perl testing is, you can write a Perl test in, I think the very shortest would be five lines, or if you make